In the top stories, plans for state funeral for Sir Probin in its in final stages. Nemo hosts natural disaster exercise in Sandy Point and training on the way to assist small businesses. The details on these stories and more after the break. Hello and welcome to the Zaraize Channel 5 newscast. I'm Carla Barrage. Plans for the state funeral of Sir Probin Innes on Thursday are in the final stages. According to information out of government headquarters, the service will take place at the Wesley Methodist Church on Seaston Street at 2.30 p.m. Accommodations have been made to facilitate an overflow of attendees by using the church hall. Video monitors and sound in the hall will allow those individuals to be a part of the service. The general public can pay their last respects to Sir Probin at Government House in Springfield. His remains will lie in state beginning at 10 a.m. on Thursday. Viewing will end at 1.30. Following the service, the body will be interred at Springfield Cemetery. The state funeral of the late Sir Probin Innes will be aired live on ZIZ Radio, ZIZ Television and ZIZOnline.com. The National Emergency Management Agency and its stakeholders conducted its annual natural disaster exercise in the Sandy Point area on Tuesday. I was on site and filed this report. The National Emergency Management Agency conducted its Carib Wave 2017 exercise to test the communication and evacuation of each participant. It began with the simulation of an earthquake early Tuesday morning which posed a tsunami threat. An alarm sounded at the targeted institutions and everyone was rushed toward the designated assembly point, the new Sandy Point Recreation Ground, to receive further information. Exercise controller for NEMA, Ivor Blake, said the agency brought its stakeholders together to assist in the response to the threat of a tsunami. He spoke of the objectives of the exercise. So we want to basically test the communication between the tsunami focal point, which was um, the police force telecommunication, and the disaster response agencies and to see how that communication right along the line is, is, um, is conducted. So there was a, we simulated an earthquake which posed a tsunami threat and which in turn caused the agencies to, to communicate that down to the general public in the real situation and hence an evacuation from the areas that will be affected to a place relatively safe so that um, we could account for those persons. Mr. Blake said it was important that the public be aware of what they're supposed to do if there is a tsunami. This is something that we hope that the general public would be aware to. Aware to. And um, because as we see most of the coast, people would live right on the coast. So in the event of a tsunami impact, that, that, those areas will be inundated. And we want people to know where the safe areas that they can go here, around, right around the island. Deputy National Disaster Coordinator Clarissa Langley-Stevens explained why they chose Sandy Point for this exercise. The reason why we targeted Sandy Point is Sandy Point's geologic um, layout allows for us to have uh, a lot of constraints. And so we wanted to see how our stakeholders will be able to deal with these constraints in the event that we are impacted during the daytime where persons are at work and in school. Of course, you know, this exercise can also be done in the night. But we wanted that human element in terms of participation. Executive member of NEMA District 5, Claudius Gums, explained the role of evaluators during the exercise. And my aim, me and the police officer, Sergeant Henry, we are here. Uh, we are here to make sure that when the... The students come up from the Sandy Point High School and the preschool and the primary school that they are safe, guide them to the route and take them to the old, to the new recreation ground. That's where we will climax and we will, we will discuss the whole exercise and so on. The police force, fire and rescue services, Red Cross and the Ministry of Education are the entities that partnered with NEMA. Following the simulated exercise, the evaluators returned to the Charles E. Mills Secondary School for a debriefing in efforts that NEMA would receive feedback from all stakeholders. 
Approximately 1,200 persons participated from the five targeted institutions, the Charles E. Mills Secondary School, the Sandy Point Primary and Preschools, and Harrow Server Buildings 1 and 2. Carib Wave is an annual tsunami exercise. Its major objective is for countries, emergency management stakeholders, and communities at risk to test, validate, and update their tsunami response plans. According to the evaluators, the evacuation process was indeed a success. Reporting from the new recreation ground in Sandy Point, I'm Carla Berridge. A number of stakeholders are currently undergoing a three-day certificate training for future small business development centers at the Chamber of Industry and Commerce with the aim of establishing centers in St. Kitts and Nevis to facilitate entrepreneurs in the small and medium-sized sector. The SBDC is an initiative that was launched by the Organization of American States in 2015. The model, as stated by OAS, focuses on one-on-one -on -one and long-term assistance to help clients generate sustained economic impact through the establishment of new businesses, new jobs, increases in sales, and access to capital and other areas. Philip Brown, Director of Industry and Commerce, said that the initiative is quite timely. This, in fact, comes at a time when our government has mandated to focus much of its resources and overall strategic growth vision on the development of the sector. The ministry and by, and by extension the government were therefore under no illusions as far as the importance of the sector is concerned, especially in light of the fact that over 90 percent of our businesses would fall into this category of micro, small, or medium. Rene Penko, OAS representative and program coordinator, said that the aim of the training is to ensure that persons get a better understanding of SBDC with a plan to establish it in St. Kitts and Nevis. We're hoping that uh, over the course of the next three days that the agencies that are represented here this morning and will be here for the next three days would be able to start thinking about how this model would look in St. Kitts and Nevis. What would be the best orientation for this model in St. Kitts and Nevis? And trust me, it is certainly my pleasure to be back again. I'm in love with your country. And so um, I'm hoping that for the next three days we can share, we can learn from facilitators that we have here, and at the end of it all, start thinking about the SBDC St. Kitts and Nevis. The project is funded by the United States government through its permanent mission to the OAS. So far, Barbados, Belize, Dominica, Jamaica, and St. Lucia have all been able to adopt and adapt the U.S. model of micro, small, and medium enterprises, MSMEs. The draft federal youth policy is going through a thorough review from members of the steering committee to ensure that it is in keeping with the goal of being a modern developmental tool that establishes priorities for the youth of St. Kitts and Nevis. The latest review session was held on Friday at the Parliamentary Lounge at Government Headquarters. The meeting was chaired by Vernon Connor, Special Advisor to the Minister of Youth, while youth expert Dwinette Eversley walked committee members through some of the chapters of the discussion draft policy and the accompanying goals and strategies. Mr. Connor said he was pleased with the process to date, having had a number of consultative sessions with public and private sector officials and other members of civil society. Society. We are also opening it up to all the stakeholders who are invited for the initial consultation so they can review what has been documented to see if what they told us in the beginning is seen in the final draft. He mentioned that the final draft is being amended by committee members to ensure that it is in line with strategic goals set by the federal government and the Nevis Island administration as well as regional and international agencies. We are in the final stages. We are actually just winding down, we are wrapping up, and we are ready to hopefully present soon to the minister. A final consultation will be held at the end of the month to present the revised draft to stakeholders. He said details for the National Symposium are being finalized and will be shared at a later date. Students and staff at the Cotton Thomas Comprehensive School joined the global community in observing World Down Syndrome Day on March 21st. 
in an effort to get people talking about World Down Syndrome Day. International organizers decided to ask people to wear fancy socks and use hashtag lots of socks on social media. Principal Shamin Blanchett spoke with ZZ about how the school is joining this year's Awareness Day. The school, along with KFC, is treating them with a sumptuous lunch. We are celebrating with the world, and in recognition of that, we are wearing socks, and I'm going to invite some of my teachers to join me here, showing the socks. Please join me, teachers. Socks, we are using socks as an awareness to, because this is being done globally, lots of socks so that when they leave their house walking on the street, they will be asked why are they dressed like that, and they can inform the community as to why they are wearing socks and as to what World Down Syndrome Day is all about. March 21st, recognized as World Down Syndrome Day, is a special day to create awareness and honor people who have the unique triplication of the 21st chromosome that causes Down Syndrome. The day is being held under the theme, My Voice, My Community. After the break, police investigate gun and ammo find at RLB International Airport. We'll tell you more when we come back. The police have seized a gun and 68 rounds of ammunition found in a piece of luggage that arrived at the Robert L. Bratcher International Airport on Thursday aboard a flight from the United States. According to a police statement, the luggage was unaccompanied and tagged to a passenger traveling to St. Kitts. The passenger never arrived in the Federation. The police said the luggage contained one Taurus .357 Magnum, revolver and 68 3.57 rounds of ammunition, two speed loaders and a holster. According to the statement, the discovery was made while following routine security protocols for unaccompanied luggage. No one in St. Kitts attempted to claim the luggage. The matter is being investigated jointly by the Customs and Excise Department and the police force. The telecommunications sector in the five Eastern Caribbean Telecommunications Authority, ECTEL countries, is expected to be boosted with the introduction of the Electronic Communications Bill aimed at better managing the sector. The bill was introduced to the federal cabinet during a meeting on Saturday at the St. Kitts Marriott Resort by officials from ECTEL. Minister of Communications Honorable Vincent Byron said that there was a need to introduce the bill so that persons can be able to understand its importance. The authority has asked that we here in St. Kitts and Nevis give us the opportunity to present to as many stakeholders as possible in St. Kitts and Nevis the new electronic communications bill that needs to be tabled and debated in Parliament so that the regulatory framework in which telecommunications in St. Kitts and Nevis operate can be reformed, revamped, brought into being. And so a major function this morning is for our team from ECTEL to introduce it to cabinet as well as generally to our parliamentary side of the government business because it will require our members on the government benches to be Ofe, to be knowledgeable of what this new bill is intended to do, how it will fill in the gaps, address any anomalies, any problems that the regulatory framework, the regulation and the regulating of the telecom sector has been experiencing. Minister Byron said that the new bill is critical for St. Kitts and Nevis and other member states in order to be able to manage how the telecommunication industry operates as well as a number of operations that were agreed to and which will accompany the new framework. 
Deborah Bowers, general legal counsel at Ectel, said that the bill is necessary because the industry has transformed beyond telecommunications. We no longer deal with just phones and telexes, but we have electronic communications and it's the World Wide Web, which is what we deal with on a daily basis now. Our legislation also does not cover mergers and acquisitions. It does not cover competition in the sector. It does not protect our consumers adequately and neither does it cover number portability, amongst other things. So the current legislation, which is the Telecommunications Act, now needs to transform to cover the industry as the industry moves ahead. She explained that the new bill is committed to net neutrality, which enables access to an open internet where member states can utilize. In addition to meeting with cabinet, the ECTEL team also met with the business community and civil society, including government departments and ministries, as well as other stakeholders who depend on the telecommunications sector. ECTEL was established on May 4, 2000 by treaty signed in St. George's, Grenada by the governments of five Eastern Caribbean states, Commonwealth of Dominica, Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. ECTEL is the regulatory body for telecommunication in its member states. It is made up of three components, a council of ministers, a regional directorate and a national telecommunications regulatory commission in each member state. This weekend, several young musicians will be paying tribute to deceased steel pen player and teacher Earl Boots Jones with a planned concert. Jones passed away 10 years ago. One of the CEOs of EBJ Harmonics, MJ Barron, spoke to ZIZ about why they have decided to hold this event in his honor. This is something we are passionate about. The, those people who would have been around him for the amount of years and realized that the kind of person that he is, a mentor, a teacher, a father, a brother, an uncle, somebody just, you could just go to and lighten up your day if you have to. Um, that is the kind of person he, he was and we wanted to honor him and celebrate that of him this coming weekend. The event is called From the Soul of My Pan and Byron explained the significance of the theme. A lot of things can come from that instrument and we're talking about soul, we're talking about the, the, the inner parts of, of the, 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 the metal as we call it and a lot of work and everything that comes from it, the passion. The, 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 the drive, the vision, everything that comes from the steel pan, we want it to come out now on stage, not just hearing, but seeing the vibes that, um, that can come out of the instrument. Aside from steel pan music, the concert will also feature other musicians, singers, and spoken word. It takes place on Saturday at 7 p.m. at the Sir Cecil Jacobs Auditorium. After capturing yet another title, the newly crowned OECS Soka Monarchs, Katie and LAX, have said the work doesn't end there as their soccer career is just beginning. In an interview with ZIZ News, Jason Katie Kite spoke of their experience while competing in Montserrat. The experience was a great experience, you know. We got to come up against some of the greatest soca artists around the Caribbean. Um, it was challenging. It was challenging. I mean, looking at some of the performers and the performances, you know, I was a bit, you know, skeptical, but we, we, all in all we went and we did our thing, you know, we nailed it and, you know, we were pleased when we came off the stage after the performance. Katie said that even though it was a different competition, the organizers and support groups were professional as they made their preparations. We had to instruct exactly what we wanted. My only thing was having time to do that. And there was a bit issue with all the artists coming in at one time to do it. But when we got our chance, we make sure we, take, we took our time and directed and instructed exactly what we wanted. Kite said since the competition, the power duo have been invited to perform around the region. Right now, LAX is in preparation to hit in um, Atlanta and St. Thomas. I will not be there, but he will represent you know, fully for me. Um, we also have a, a wet fed competition in Anguilla coming up soon. We hope to take part in that. And we also have to go back to Monstrat next year. God be alive to de defend our crown. And we're going to try to put our foot in earlier for Trinidad as well. 
last year we were a bit behind because of the music and carnival being so close in that area. So that's, what, that's our goal. Ketty and LAX won the OECS Soka Mona competition with their hit songs Jack Hammer and Big Truck. Coming up, vehicle collision in Barbados injures 18 and a 74-year-old senior citizen found dead near St. Lucia River. The details when we come back. month of March. Huge savings up to 50% off and pay nothing for 60 days. Visit a court store near you for pure madness. Look out for crazy deals up to 50% off and you pay nothing for 60 days. The man only a court. To miss it would be pure madness. Courts must be crazy. What? Courts must be mad. How you mean? Courts must be crazy. Courts mad again. Courts bringing value home. In Barbados, a collision between a truck and a minibus has left 18 people injured. More in this Nation News Barbados report. 18 people were injured on Monday morning when a minibus and a truck collided along Black Rock Main Road, St. Michael. 16 minibus passengers and the drivers of both vehicles were injured. The driver of the truck, 68-year-old Tony Clark of Fitz Village, St. James, was the most seriously hurt. He suffered multiple fractures to both legs. The driver of the minibus, 47-year-old Anderson Squires of Oxner St. James, suffered a laceration to his head and abrasions to his arm. The passengers' injuries were described as minor. The crash triggered the island's mass casualty response from the Barbados Fire Service, Emergency Ambulance Service, and the Barbados Defense Force. St. Lucia residents are mourning after a missing 74-year-old senior citizen was found dead near a river on Sunday. More in this report. The search for a missing senior citizen has ended tragically. 74-year-old Edmund Creek of Bay Street Library, affectionately known as Mr. Raleigh, was found prostrate in the Laho Jetwin tributary along the Saltibus River Monday morning. According to reports, a library resident made the discovery around 11 a.m. A search party had been scouring the area for days in the wake of his mysterious disappearance in the Laho area. This morning, uh I had to talk about it if I want to go and have a search with him. So I went up, I started walking down the river side. That's part this way, I said, no, let me go up the river side this way. And then almost a mile out, I walk, I walk, I walk, and then suddenly I discovered that man just lying down, face down in the river. And that's all I know. You went to other people? I, then I called my friend, I told him to call the police right away. Although the beloved senior was reported missing on March 13th, he actually vanished on Saturday, March 11th. However, loved ones who grew anxious after his loyal pet, who goes by the name Romaine, returned home without his master, have been combing the densely wooded area from the outset. This man is reportedly one of the last people to see Mr. Raleigh alive. Well, he was coming down the road. When he reached by the little track, he was under the shade. He asked us if they still have road. We tell him, yeah, and he followed the track, he and his dog. And I never see him again after that day. In spite of the grim outcome, the senior's widow is relieved to have her husband's remains. From the very Saturday, they told, they told me he was missing. I kept looking for him. And we never give up. The only day we have not looked for him, that was yesterday, Sabbath. So today we say definitely we have to find him wherever he is. Because from day one, we have not been sleeping. So I'm happy that he is found. So that... We brought closure so we know we have him and he's, he's dead. But we will try our best to meet him alive, but we did not meet him. The senior citizen was reportedly afflicted with dementia. He also suffered with a dodgy right leg, which was swollen, dark, and usually bandaged. Authorities hope an autopsy will help determine what happened to Mr. Raleigh in the woodlands of Laho. Winston Springer Jr., HDS News Force. Coming up, Trump fans in Kentucky say they are unbothered by the FBI's probe and the U.S. prepares to ban large electronic devices on Middle East flights. The details when we come back.
As Donald Trump appeared at a rally in Kentucky, his supporters there say they are unmoved by the FBI's probe into Russian links. More in this report. As Donald Trump appeared at a rally in Kentucky, his supporters appeared unimpressed by news the FBI is to investigate possible collusion between his election team and Russia. The agency's chief, James Comey, also told a congressional hearing he'd seen no evidence that the U.S. president had been wiretapped by Barack Obama, an unsupported claim ridiculed by intelligence officials. But these Trump fans are unmoved. I think Comey's very uh, untrustworthy. They need somebody else that's under him in the FBI testifying. Because what credibility does he have? I mean, it's known that he's a Democratic uh, type FBI person. You know, it's like the Democrats and the media. You know, when uh, things are going their way in power, they can look the other way. So now that they're out, hey, they're playing a different game. The president didn't mention the FBI inquiry at the rally, but the White House, which has denied collusion with Moscow over its alleged meddling in the election, has tried to distance the president from figures involved in his campaign whose Russian links are under scrutiny. It also refuses to drop the wiretap claim, saying interesting news is yet to come. People flying to the U.S. from eight Muslim-majority countries are to be banned from taking laptops and tablets in the cabin. The Department of Homeland Security says the new measure is due to security threats. Passengers will have to put devices larger than a smartphone in their checked bag. Al Jazeera's Rob Matheson reports. A bomb explodes on a Somali passenger plane, ripping a hole in its side. The plane makes an emergency landing at Mogadishu, filmed by terrified passengers huddled in the rear seats. Somali authorities say a passenger was given a laptop after he passed through security checks. They say the bomb could have been inside. The attack happened last year. It's what airlines fear most. And why passengers at many large airports have to go through such time-consuming checks. Now the U.S. says it's temporarily banning laptops, tablet computers, cameras and other personal electronics. But only on direct flights from 10 airports, all in predominantly Muslim countries. It has to be based on a, a credible threat that you're going to uh, not be able to carry a computer. So we're now going to place in the underfloor of the aircraft a considerable number of devices, all with lithium batteries. Now, we know today that is a safety issue. So I hope that we're not just knee-jerking here and that this is a very credible threat and that the safety issues have also been very carefully thought through. We have to have security in our country. We have this is the third time in as many months that President Donald Trump's administration has attempted to introduce restrictions on travelers to the United States. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. The previous two focused on immigration, banning individuals from mainly Muslim nations. Both times, the bans have been overruled by American courts as unconstitutional. That whenever you have a hostility uh, towards a, a particular religion or, or a particular uh, nation of origin, uh, that's certainly going to be something that, uh, that's going to be uh, not only improper, but something that's uh, violating the Constitution. The U.S. has not yet given details of a specific threat which may have prompted this ban on electronics. Mobile phones and medical equipment will be allowed on board. Rob Matheson, Al Jazeera. Up next in sports, Mexican media company apologizes for Tom Brady jersey theft scandal. Stay tuned. It's the court's home event. Shop today and complete your kitchen, your dining room and your entertainment room. Shop using Ready Finance. It's easy, affordable, and flexible credit. Plus, you pay nothing down on purchases 24 months and over. So come in today and get great deals to complete your home at the Quartz Home Event. Quartz, bringing value home. Former NFL wide receiver Dwight Clark recently announced that he had been diagnosed with ALS. The former NFL wide receiver for the San Francisco 49ers made the announcement on his website saying he first noticed his symptoms in 2015. More in this report. 
Former 49ers wideout Dwight Clark, recipient of the catch, announced Sunday that he has ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Clark made the announcement on his website saying he first noticed symptoms in 2015 and he suspects his playing days in the NFL might have caused his diagnosis. According to the ALS Association, the disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that affects nerve cells in the brain and the spinal cord. The disease makes it hard for people affected to walk, get dressed, or even breathe. Clark's diagnosis and his suggestion that his playing days might have caused the disease plays into the link between professional football players and diseases caused by severe head trauma. Since 2011, more than 5,000 former NFL players have filed lawsuits against the league for failing to protect players from severe head trauma. Many of those players showed symptoms of ALS or another disease called CTE. Clark wrote on his website that he encourages the NFL and the league's Players Association to work together to make the game safer, especially as it relates to head trauma. A Mexican media company has apologized for Tom Brady's recent jersey theft scandal. The apology comes after the NFL announced on Monday that Brady's jersey was recovered and found in the possession of an unidentified member of the international media in Mexico. Hesmar. OEM, the largest newspaper company in Mexico, has issued a formal apology after a former employee became a suspect in the theft of Tom Brady's Super Bowl jersey. Former OEM employee Martin Mauricio Ortega Camberos resigned for personal reasons on March 14. At the time, he was not known to be associated with the jersey theft. In a statement, the paper says that it, quote, fully condemns the behavior of Martin Mauricio Ortega Camberos, who took advantage of his position and used La Prensa to access the field, press conferences, and other areas of NRG Stadium. When we come back, we'll have another look at the stories that made the headlines. Recapping the top stories, Nemo hosts natural disaster exercise in Sandy Point, trending on the way to assist small businesses and draft federal youth policy undergoes review process. And that's the end of the ZIZ Channel 5 newscast. Thank you for joining us. I'm Gala Verge. Goodbye.